Hello, welcome to Podfix Galore. I'm your horrible online reader, Cold Scythe. I read out loud fan fictions for you busy bees, free of charge and no strings attached. Today I will be continuing reading the Silmarillion fic by Aeolian Sands from Archive of Our Own called The Rescue Party. I hope you can at least try to enjoy my voice and I will try my best with all the equipment that is available to me. I am very sorry of the long pause I've had between here. I've had a lot of happenings. I'm trying to get back into this. Alright, note, chapter 26 was bonus content of Plate Tectonics, so I will be continuing from chapter 27. On with the show. The Rescue Party by Aeolian Sands. Chapter 27. Ill-Conceived Escapes. Varda knocked softly on on the door to Nama's room. There was no answer, but the Queen of Stars was not about to let her errand to check on the doomsman and his wife be in vain. Gently, she opened the heavy oak door. Lord Nama, she called. Only Osse came to the summons. We are worried about you. Yet, when the door opened to reveal the dimly lit room, she saw no sign of her fellow Vala. The chair and the desk were empty. The large bed with its purple embroidered quilt was made and unslept in. Tapestries depicting the land as it had been under the lamps hung still and motionless. Varda herself glowed softly as she walked into the room. Nama? Vaira? she asked. But they were not there. They had not been in the throne room either. Varda's heart began to sink. As Arian crested over the encircling mountains, Egalmoth and the other lords of Gondolin took their places on chairs set on either side of the grand hall where the king had his throne. As Rok yawned, the lord of the heavenly ark noticed how Turgon glared at the empty chair at the Sindas' side. Lord Drog, the king asked from the day. Yes? Where is my uncle? I thought he spent the night with Egalmoth. He didn't look to be feeling too well at Urlog's last night. All eyes turned to Egalmoth. Oh, you had one responsibility. No, last time I saw Fëanarë was at the mines. I gave him some herbs because I knew he would be sore after the day's labors. Maybe he's just running late. After all, Councillor Maeglin isn't even here yet, Ekthelion mentioned. Turgon frowned even more so at the second empty chair beside his throne. Egalmoth had a sinking feeling in his gut. Maeglin is never late. Duilin must have been thinking the same. Councillor Maeglin is always the first of us here. He would rather die than not be punctual. He's constantly reprimanding everyone else, the other archer said. There were nods of agreement. I think... Glorfinda began with uncharacteristic hesitation. I, I think maybe we should take a look outside. Turgon rose from his throne. Soon everyone else was also standing, and the lords of Gondolin hustled in a group to the double doors off to the side of the hall, which led to the walls of the king's tower. They clambered to the battlements and leaned over the side, peering at the snow-covered peaks. And there, in the distance, were two figures scaling a sheer cliff of ice. Both had raven dark hair and appeared to be using ice picks to work their way up the vertical wall. Egalmo thought his eyes had failed. Fear not attempting something so asinine was to be expected, but Maeglin? Maeglin, who was a stickler for the law. Counselor Maeglin, who would not hesitate to throw you down the Karakdur if you ever thought about walking out at the gates? Boy, Ero Ilovatar. Fionor's words were still as powerful as ever if he could convince unyielding Maegling to scale an ice cliff. Well, that's not something you see every day, Dulin observed, breaking the long silence. Turgon's jaw twitched. It might be a difficult shot, but you and Egonmoth might be able to bring them down before they reach the ridge. Zalgant replied. Something lurched within Egalmoth's fear. No, I cannot. 
Turgon's whole body was now tense as a bowstring. I will not order my own nephew to be shot, he said, only partially succeeding in keeping the anger out of his tone. Surely your law applies to all peoples. Already you made an exception for your sister. What does it say if the king treats his family as above the law? Enough, Salgant, Turgon commanded. An arrow through the hand might stop them, but the distance is long and even archers are as great as Egalmoth and Duelin might just as easily miss and kill them. Even in the best case scenario, we will have crippled the two greatest myths of the Noldor. It is not an option. Thus, let me go after them, Rock declared. No, I'm you will not. You. Two voices spoke at once. Ekalmoth turned to see Glorfindel standing next to Rog. Oh, somehow that wasn't surprising either. Please, my king, Rog said. It is my fault for not watching Fëanor more closely. I should be the one to find him. I can bring him back before the forces of Morgoth are any wiser. And you, Lord of Indele? Turgon said, eyeing the other lord. Glorfindel dropped to one knee and said nothing. Nothing needed to be spoken. Turgon already knew. Egalmoth knew. They all knew how desperately Glorfindel had been wanting to get out. He had been stalking about the last several years like a caged lion. And when the eagles carried Fingolfin's crushed body back to them, Glorfindel's simmering anger had been complete. It was a near miracle that he did not flee, riding like Fingolfin, to take on all of Morgoth's forces himself. After a long moment, Turgon sighed and his shoulders slumped a little. It was as if the weight of the entire continent fell from him. All right, Lord of Indle, you and Rog can go. I expect you not to be seen and to quickly return my nephew back safely. Ecthelion cleared his throat and stepped forward. Turgon's eye twitched as some of that weight returned. Fine, Ecthelion goes too, because Ulmo knows you need someone with wisdom. If any one of you gets captured, I will be extremely displeased. Rog smiled in his lopsided way. We never done that! He slung his arms around Ecthelion and Glorfindel. Don't worry, the hammer, the flower and the fountain are nigh unstoppable. Egalmoth turned and watched one figure on the cliffside help the other over the ridge. Ulmo, keep them safe, he prayed as they vanished over the other side. Ulmo, as it happened, was walking through the bustling streets of Egalrest in the Falas, one of the two sister cities under Kirtan's direct rule. Arian was shining brightly on its yellow stone buildings, and all about them were vendors and merchants selling their wares. Gilgalad was completely enthralled by the activity around him. The half-elf's eyes were as large as the silver coins being traded by the elves as he eyed exotic fruits and fish on the tables. Hey kid! Someone shouted. What's the possum, squid? Ulmo turned to see a silver-haired elf holding a dead squid out to his young charge. No, he does not, thank you, Ulmo answered, taking Gilgad by the arm to keep him from doing anything impulsive. Hi, what do you know, old man? I haven't seen you two around. I can use some young strength on my fishing boat. What do you say, kid? Do you wish to sail the seas with me? I will teach you how to catch the best fish in the east. He is not interested, answered Ulmo. Ah, don't be a wet blanket. I bet you haven't even been on the water. Give the kid a chance. Ulmo chuckled. Good day to you, he answered. Then he half dragged Garanthir's son away. Arthur, what was that thing he was trying to sell me? Ah yes, another question. At first Gilgalad had been as silent as an iceberg, but by about the third day of walking he had warmed up considerably. It had been a welcome change until the questions began. It was a squid. Does it come from the deep? Not that one, but there are larger ones lurking in the deep. Gilgalad seemed to consider that for a moment. He tucked his arm back from Ulmo's grip, but kept up the brisk pace. Good. Ulmo looked at the palace on the cliff. Girdan, faithful one. I surely hope you are our home. Oof! Ulmo spun to see that Gilgalad had collided with an elderly human woman. 
Both were now on the ground. My lady, I'm, I am sorry, the half-elf proclaimed, immediately getting up and extending an arm to help the old woman to her feet. Thankfully, she did not appear to be injured. Don't worry, young man, she said as she stood. Then she turned to look at Gilgard and froze. Oh no. Uma quickly walked to his charge's side, but already the woman was reaching out to touch the half-elf's face. Your... your face, she said. You look so much like someone I once knew. Every worry, Gilgard backed away. Uh, I... I... I do? Yes, you look just like a young version of the Princess of the Noldor. The high elves from across the sea. The same high cheekbones, the same intelligent eyes. Even your hair could be the same as Lord Vingon or Lord Garanthir if it were just a few shades darker. Then the woman looked at Ulma with intense blue eyes, and she gasped. Who are you? She said, and Ulma realized at once that this woman had picked up on something inhuman in his features. Damn it all. I am a mere fisherman. You are an observant one where my friend is concerned. However, Halgad here is the son of Fingon. High King Fingon? This is the crown prince? Shit. Uma forgot about the succession. How can you forget about the succession? Elves die, remember? You can't just make him the son of a king. Fingon hasn't even wed. Um, no, forgive me, I misspoke. The lady raised a thin, white eyebrow. He is actually the son of Orodreth. Orodreth? Angarada has a grandson? The use of Angrod's Quenya name was not lost on Ulmo. Olosa has been living here. We are good friends and she never mentioned a son. She always just talks about Fiend with us. Gilgala took a defiant step forward. No. If I am anyone's son, I am the son of Haleth, he proclaimed. Ulmo slapped the palm of his hand to his face. He really should have rehearsed this with the Petatil earlier. Haleth of the Haladin? That means... Boy, Eru Ilovatar, you're half elven! All my life I have heard that the union between elves and men was not meant to be. Yet here you are, leaving proof of the contrary. Candles and moths and... All of Feynrod's nonsense. You know, sometimes I think that that king of Nargothrond doesn't know what he is talking about. Gilgod at once retreated from the rambling woman. Ulma realized all too belatedly who she was. Why she had such knowledge of the Noldor. Andreth. Andreth of the house of Beor gave a small curtsy. She leaned forward and whispered in accent at Telerin in Ulmo's ear. He's one of the Feanorians, isn't he? Garanthers? Uma gently clasped her hand. Yes, but this must not be said aloud. I am escorting him to Girdan. There was a shimmer in the woman's glance. Uma realized that he wasn't out of the hot water yet. She continued in Telerin. And you never answered my question. Who are you? Why would he trust some elderly man with him? There is something off about your eyes. They are too deep and shine too brightly. You are one of their gods. Aganara told me about your kind. This woman's intelligence was unsettling. And what if I am? Would you still keep me from my quest to see Lord Kirtan? The lady held the Vala's gaze. No, she said at last. Let me be your escort. I visit Kirtan's court often. And none would question my coming and going. With that, Andreth turned and started walking towards the center of the city with her chin held a little too high. Ulmo reluctantly followed her, motioning for Gilgalad to do the same. What language was that? The Beretil asked him, always with their questions. Telerin. What did she say? She's going to help us take to see your father's friend. Thankfully, Gilgalad accepted this, and the two of them fell in step behind Andreth. When they reached the next street, Andreth motioned for them to turn right, away from the sea, to the main thoroughfare of Ekalrest. Yet, they hadn't made it two steps down the wide cobblestone street when Ulmo felt someone breathing down his neck. What? Rapidly, the Vala turned. 
only to nearly headbutt a very tall figure with long silver hair dressed in a long purple cloak who was most definitely in his personal space. There was no question as to who would be dressed like that and also be nearly 12 feet tall. Oh, damn it! Gilgard was turning to see what was going on and fast as lightning, Ulrich grabbed the looming figure by the collar and wrenched his head down. Ow! Change it. Now! Ulmer hissed in Valarin. What? You look like the Grim Reaper from Manish Myth. It's about fitting in normal. What the fuck is this? It's my elven form? Orc shit! Lose the cape at about five feet off your height. Now! Because now both Gilgalad and Andrath were staring, Ulma called up a large gust of wind to distract them. As the cold sea wind whipped in their faces, Nama finally shapeshifted into something that vaguely resembled a Teleri elf. His hair now had a slight wave in it, and he was a more reasonable seven feet. Plus, he was now wearing an embroidered grey and purple tunic that cloak wrapped around one arm. Heavens, where did that gust come from? It nearly blew me off my feet. And on such a clear day. Oh, hello, young elf. You startled me with that cape on earlier. For a moment, I thought you were a ghost. Andreth explained. My deepest apologies, Nama muttered. Gilgalad just stared at them both, suspicion in his eyes. Is this a friend? Andreth asked. Unfortunately, this is... Well, he is named Nama, like the Lord of the Dead. Perhaps his mother named him too well, Ulma said, not even bothering with an alias for his fellow Vala. Nama would probably end up forgetting it anyway. Well met, Nama. I am Andreth, and yours? I don't believe you introduced yourself. Oh, forgive me, I am Ardur. A fine name. Nama, will you be joining us? The two disguised Valar glared at one another. I guess he shall be, Ulma accepted his defeat, still wondering why in creation Nama was here. Fjallnara was leaping over the boulder field at the base of Ekoriath Mountains. He could taste freedom in the sweet mountain air. Slow down! You're going to cause a rock slide and let everyone know where we are! His nephew called from behind him, stumbling over the rocks in his longer robes. Fenor actually stopped, placing one foot on top of a boulder so that he stood like a statue of a conquering hero. He watched as Maeglin stumbled to him. They already know we are here, he said. Maeglin's eyes went wide for a second. Fenor stepped off his pedestal of rock and gently took Maeglin by the shoulders. Nephew? We are not a family that sneaks around under the cover of darkness. Such is a way of cowards. Maglin bristled and struck Fjallnar's hand off. I'm not craven, he replied tersely. Good, then let's move. The sooner we are off these rocks, the better. Together, the two elves continued their scramble until gradually the boulders gave way to smaller stones. Eventually, they stumbled into a small copse of evergreen trees, which shaded them from the now afternoon sun. See? We made it! Fjallnar proclaimed, dusting his hands off. Now the sun rises in the east, so that would mean Angaban must be to our right. Fjallnar turned on his heel, so he was facing north. No! Marklin spoke up in alarm. That way would take us into deeper and darker woods, then up to into more mountains. It would be the best to go west first, to the river. Fjallnar thought for a second, then, surprisingly, conceded. All right. I guess the mountains would slow us down a bit, and he started marching east. Maglin turned to take one last look at the Ekoriath. This is good, he reminded himself. I never fit in anyway. But even as he told himself this, he remembered Turgon proudly presenting him a new book for his begetting day. And there was Idril with her golden hair, laughing and tossing apples down from the fruit trees as they helped bring down the fall's harvest. But I was never family to them. Either they only pretends to tolerate me, and the king needed a pity case. That's the only reason he made me counselor. But the voice in his head was that of his father. He looked up at Fenor's back as he walked. Somewhere his grand uncle had acquired a long stick which he was using to whack at the occasional bush. Clearly, this man knew nothing of stealth. He was going to call the orcs on them in an instant. Fjallnaro, he hissed. Might you try to make our presence not so obvious? 
I grew up in the forests of Beleriand, and they're full of evil and fell creatures. Let's not call them on our heads. If those beasts arrive, they will be of little challenge for the two of us. I beg to differ. You know not what forces dwell here, or you simply court death. Fenor sighed and dropped the stick. I saw you, glancing back. I was making sure we had no followers. No, you were second guessing following me. Fenor stopped and sighed. Lomion, I look at you and I see my sons. You could be Guru Finwe for your skill, Mori Finwe for your intelligence, and Gana Finwe for your looks. I. Last time one of my sons looked back, well, he burned for it. Of all that I have done, that is what I regret most. I didn't know you were capable of regret. You would think differently if you burned the boat your child slept on. I'm perfectly capable of regret, but I dare not dwell in it. I cannot stop. I must act. I must end the oath and the enemy. This is why I do not look back. End the oath? Yes, it has caused my sons enough suffering. Mowgli probably should have said something in reply, but he was struck by the thought that even Fëanor must have loved his sons, must still love them now in his own way. Yet my father couldn't bring himself to the same. The two elves walked in on silence as the trees began to thin and give to a highland plain. Wildflowers were growing between moss-covered rocks and patches of green grasses. By the river Sirion, a gravel path wandered lazily. Let's take the path, Fëanor said. It will make the going quicker. We will be in open. You were the one that wanted to go by the river. Michael didn't bother answering that. There was, after all, a perfectly sane middle ground between rock climbing sheer peaks and waltzing down an exposed path in broad daylight at a stone's throw away from Dolin Gauroth. Glorfindel, Ecthelion, and the rock were waist deep in the freezing waters of the Sirion, crouching below the steep bank and the path beside it. Oh, this is another great idea of yours, Laura. Now we are cold and wet and can barely see anything, Ecthelion grumbled. Says the Lord of the Fountain, Rog snickered. Ecthelion's frown deepened. It's unnecessary. Shh! Here they come, Glorfindel exclaimed, hand going to his sword. Oh, great. They were about to instigate the second kinslaying. Wait for my signal, Lord of the Golden Flower whispered. Ecthelion almost rolled his eyes. Already he could hear the crunch of feet on gravel. Glorfindel had his left hand slightly raised and was counting down from three on his fingers. When he reached zero, he made a fist and then leapt over the bank. Surrender, you fugitives! He cried as Ecthelion reluctantly followed. Oh, look! The Vanya menace! Fëanor shouted, and Ecthelion saw him drawing his sword as well. Immediately, the captain of Gondolin and the former High King were trading blows. Ecthelion turned to look at Maeklin, who had gone even paler than normal. It's okay, Counselor. Fëanor once convinced us to follow him as well. In this transgression, not even Turgano is guiltless. Anger flashed in Maeklin's eyes. I won't go back disgraced. Disgraced? Rog chuckled, leaning on his hammer as the sounds of various war cries echoed in the distance. Counselor, King Turukan adores you. I dare say he loves you more than the rest of us combined. They simply tolerates the rest of us, Ecthelion winked. Then he nodded at the battle behind them. Some of us require more tolerating than others. Michael could not shake off the hatred he felt welling in his heart. Who are these shinning lords to tell him what to do? Rog and his people who act like they own the mines? Ecthelion and Lara Findele, who have never respected me? No, he said. All of you gondolin them despise me, and now you would hate me even more. And that's if I lived. We know the law. We do, but it was a bit of a stupid law anyway, Rog smiled. But Maglin was reaching for his sword. He could not endure the humiliation of a return to that city. Idril probably wouldn't even look at him now. Fast as lightning, he unsheathed it. Ecthelion was a blur of silver as he danced to intercept the strike. Go help Laura with the feral one over there, he commanded Rog as he locked blades with Maglin. 
Rock nodded and wandered over to where Fjellner and Glorfindel were exchanging insults. Wilted flower! Walking corpse! Your hair isn't even that great. Even Aras is shinier and more golden too. It's better than yours. What do you wash it with? Suit and ashes? Maybe I'll just cut yourself. You wouldn't dare! Rock cleared his throat, but the other two elves were ignoring him as they circled and parried and lunged for each other. Alright, he would do it the hard way. Flipping his hammer around so that the handle pointed outwards, he swung for Fjallner's legs. To his great surprise, the blow was blocked. What the? He looked up to see Fjallner with the eyes on fire, holding his sword that was blocking Glorfindel's strike in one hand and his ice pick that was blocking his warhammer with the other. In that instant, he looked a bit mad. Have a V! I will take you both! Fjallner shouted. And then he was a whirl as he swung his ice pick and sword. Rock had to give him credit. Fjellner was strong. Certainly not a foe to be messed with on the battlefield. Yet the reach of the ice pick was short and it was clear that the Nolder was tiring. The Sindal looked at Glorfindel who nodded. Together they swung at Fjellner in unison. The Lord of the Flower aiming for Fjellner's chest and Rock swinging the hilt of his hammer once more at Fjellner's legs. This time he was not able to block them both. Fjellner was knocked off balance and fell on the road heavily. Immediately, Glorfinder put his sword at his neck. Drop the weapons, he ordered. Fjellner did so to the surprise of the Lords of Gondolin. Hands, Glorfinder ordered. Fjellner rolled his eyes but offered them up. And Glorfinder was quick to bind them with a the rope and then a whole Fjellner to his feet. The sound of metal bouncing across stone greeted their ears and all three looked up to see Ecthelion disarm Maeglin. Rock thought that overall this retrieval mission was going better than could be expected. End of chapter 27. Stay tuned.